Um, okay, we'll get started right away. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for a lecture from Zaina Koratim and John May, um, Together Millions. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kyle Miller. I'm an associate professor here at Syracuse Architecture, and I'll be hosting the event. Um, please also note that um, if you'd like to enable captions, you can simply click the closed caption button on the bottom of the Zoom interface. Let me type this note in the chat room quickly. Um, and you can, uh, the, we're having a technical issue with the captions, but I, I think they'll be enabled shortly. Um, and you can um, just click the closed caption button on the bottom of the Zoom interface to able, enable those subtitles. Um, thank you to Melissa for typing the captions. Um, so first to introduce Zaina and John, um, who last winter were actually visiting critics here um, in Syracuse, teaching a studio to third and fourth year students as well as graduate students. Um, their lecture was one of the first uh, events to be canceled in response to COVID restrictions. So we're very happy that we can kind of complete the process and, and have them back here with us this afternoon. Uh, Zaina Koratem is a registered architect in Beirut and also um, as of recently I just learned full-time design faculty at SciArc. Uh, she holds a BARC from the American University in Beirut as well as an MARC II from University of Toronto uh, and an MDES from GSD. Um, her writings on computational color and computer graphics have been published in Project Journal, EFLUX, um, as well as in the Harvard Design Magazine. John May is an assistant professor of architecture at GSD um, and like Zaina, a prolific writer. Um, two of John's recent publications, um, one titled Signal Image Architecture and the other titled Design Techniques, um, Archaeologies of Architectural Practice, um, explore a lot of uh, dimensions of architectural practice today that are quite pertinent, um, philosophy, history, politics, and technology. Um, and John holds a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy and Visual Art from the College of William and Mary, uh, a Master's of Architecture from Harvard GSD, and a Doctorate in Geography and Environmental Studies from UCLA. Um, together, as I mentioned earlier, uh, John and Zaina lead millions of a design practice based in Los Angeles. Uh, to quote John and Zaina, millions conceives of architecture as a speculative medium for exploring the central categories of contemporary life, technology, politics, energy, media, and information. Uh, their recent work includes completed and ongoing projects in California, uh, New York, Boston, Germany, and as well as Lebanon. Um, and perhaps most exciting for us here in Syracuse, uh, Millions was selected as the winner of an international competition to reimagine the East Wing of IM Pei's Everson Museum um, here in downtown. I always try to peek in the side window when I'm walking my dog uh, nearby and it seems that it's coming along. I, I just learned that phase one um, will hopefully be completed in, in summer. Uh, I've been following John's and Zaina's work for many years now. Um, I mean this when I say I'd be hard pressed to name another office um, in our generation that produces more captivating and seductive environments and imagery. Um, and I wrote that prior to seeing exactly what type of delightful visualization we're in for tonight that you're having a preview of now. So my statement holds true. Um, from their design for Jack Irwin's first retail space to visualizations produced for their Beirut rooftop speculation, uh, their work truly embodies their ambition to explore the intersection of technology, information, and atmosphere. Uh, lastly, regarding the format of the event, um, I'll soon hand over the screen to Zaina and John. Um, after their talk, Professor Evie Diamantopoulou has kindly agreed to provide a response to the talk and perhaps ask the first questions. Um, and after that, we can take questions from everybody else. So the raise your hand function is now accessible in the reactions button. Um, you can do that if you'd like to ask your question aloud, or you can simply type your question in the chat room um, and I can ask the question for you. And I suppose it's also a okay if you start, if, if anyone who would like to ask a question starts to populate the chat room with those questions at any given time. Um, and then after the talk, we can kind of revisit that list and, and see what makes for a compelling conversation. Um, okay, Zaina and John, welcome. Thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much for this generous introduction and thank you for the invitation. Uh, we're millions and we will begin. So, um, We'll of course show the, the Everson Museum project at the end. Um, 
we're first going to discuss some some parallel projects. Um, these are useful for understanding um, not not so much our approach, but maybe more fundamentally the sort of state of mind, um, the state of mind we were in somewhat before uh, Everson and COVID, and then and then the state of mind that we're in now. Um, so much obviously has changed since that competition. Um, so much of life has changed. We thought it might be useful then to use this conversation in a way to actually just to remind ourselves um, in a sense um, about some previous ideas, but also um, previous uh, sensibilities and emotions, um, maybe sensibilities around um, closeness and nearness, um, intimacy, uh, communality, um, ideas that, that seemed so easy to discuss um, a year ago, but now seem um, kind of remote and improbable, um, but which maybe we can recapture and revitalize soon. Um, uh, in a way, those, those as we think back on, on, as we went back through some of these projects uh, last night and this morning, um, those emotions can be expressed in a kind of oblique question, we think, um, which seems to always permeate the work, um, which is something like, um, what does it mean to organize a collection? So what does it mean to, to gather up scattered individuals and objects and ideas into a gathering, into a kind of shared experience? Um, not according to some sort of rigid social or technical order, but instead by by, by rendering those things together, by handing them over, uh, by creating a kind of collection of the organic and the inorganic. And, and, and also alongside this, how might those kinds of gatherings become more regular and routine and a part of daily life? Um, in, a, in a very general sense, those, our work finds sort of two ways into those questions. The first is, is material or what maybe if you like environmental, and it's very simple. It's, um, it's the fact that certain lived acti activities, when they're shared, they simply produce a smaller carbon footprint than when those same activities are produced individually. Um, so we accept this as a kind of quasi-objective condition in our work, and we're always trying to find ways to realize um, ideas around that basic fact. Um, and then second, for, for many years, actually, well prior to COVID, we've argued in our writings that the ideal building block for, for neoliberalism, for neoliberal ideology, it's sort of most fundamental genetic unit in a way is the completely spatially isolated individual um, connected to life only by way of utilities and immediate cable. Uh, and, and, and the spatial politics of, of, of neoliberalism really thrives on this idea. It's uh, on the possibility that we might all be molded into that, that simple form. Uh, and it's always trying to realize this through various different techniques. So our work in a way is always continually asking this kind of naive, but but sincere and maybe useful question about how can architecture assist in, in disassembling the conditions of modern loneliness, um, which again were, were themes in the work well prior to COVID um, and maybe have only become, well, maybe we're only more convinced of that now. So although we won't be concentrating on these projects in any detail, um, these are projects, really families of objects. Mm -hmm. Uh, that because they are conceived of as open series were very much, you know, they're still ongoing, um, maybe forever, we don't know, uh, but they continue to be important vehicles for asking all kinds of questions about contemporary life and contemporary techniques. So they seem always relevant to us. Um, some of these series are what we think of in the office as proto-architectures. They are experiments uh, of various sizes and scales um, in which we might just be testing a few, you know, new techniques, uh, new media, new relationship between hardware and software or new fabrication methods. Other series are speculations on possible future architectures, uh, which we call collectives, future ways of living, future massings for future masses. Not utopian so much, uh, but simply optimistic in which we try to wonder about ways of life that might be possible in the present or very near future. These are often also experiments in a kind of uh, politics of thermodynamics, which we won't talk about so much today or in the following projects, but which we, remains uh, an intense interest in our office. <laughs> 
in more normal times, we would always spend time in Lebanon each year in Beirut um, and in the mountains, but also we would travel around the, the region. Of course, with COVID, um, we did not go to Lebanon this year, but we, at the time when we began traveling, John and I, we had become fascinated with pre-modern Basin cultures, Ottoman baths in particular at Beidatim, um, a, a location, an Ottoman bath in Lebanon that I have grown up going to many times, but also Asian practices at places like Baalbek, the Heliopolis near, near Lebanon's Syrian borders. So when, when, so when we were commissioned by Juan Garcia Mosqueda, founder of Chamber Gallery to pr produce a furniture set for a show he was organizing at Friedman Benda, we knew right away that we'd produce some kind of bathing set. Bathing was a social activity for thousands of years and still is for many cultures. In Roman bathing culture, for example, the average working day ended at noon and the remainder of the day was spent at the bathhouse, socializing, exercising, cleaning, conversing, eating, even engaging in political debates. We're not nostalgic for that time, but we can borrow certain ideas and revitalize them in our time. The history of pre-modern bathing testifies to its transformations during just the past 150 years. It wasn't until the late 19th century that the bathroom became thought of as a separate efficient space in the home. Prior to that, uh, there was always a kind of communal spaciousness to the bath bathing arrangements. It was in America beginning in the early 20th century that the private bath cell achieved its purest form. The compact bathroom, as it was known, was largely the result of one crucial development in early 20th century America, the aligning of all fixtures along a single wet wall. Coupled with the invention of the built-in one-sided cast bathtub, which set the normative width of a standard um, residential bathroom, the wet wall was a technical revolution in the history of hygiene. It inaugurated a period of intensive cellularization that in our time has culminated in a severe desocialization of a once social activity. So by the 21st century bathing, which once meant Um, sorry, which was meant entering into an extended social period of conversation, relaxation, enjoyment, and semi-collective self-care has been reduced to a private and individualized routine, reduced to the twin functions of efficiency and hygiene, the only relationship between oneself and one's own reflection. We wanted from the beginning to completely destabilize this modern conception of bathing, we decided the set would be a kind of loose but flexible arrangement of pieces that can be scalable to fit large space, smaller spaces, outdoor or indoor spaces in a living room or a bedroom. Once the routines around bathing are opened up, any arrangement scenario becomes possible. Part of what we are interested in is rethinking how day-to-day -day, uh, isolated practices can merge with one another and produce entirely new cycles of life. So the work was much more of a furnishing of bathing uh, than the design of bathing fixtures. We wanted to produce anti-fixtures. So the wash basin finish is extremely difficult to photograph because its iridescence really requires movement. You have to move around it to see the colors beneath the surface. The organization itself, which appears completely dishelved or haphazard, relies of course on precise tolerances and sympathies between numerical material processes, specifically CNC and 3D silica deposition. We wanted the roundness or in the roundness to be destabilizing, unfamiliar, but of course the angles of incidence among a series of very heavy elements. 
The wash basin alone is over 800 pounds. It had to be very carefully prefigured through computational processes and it had to be lifted uh, with this sort of almost ancient um, tool. Near tangencies and adjacencies had to be calibrated prior to installation or the entire composition would have spun progressively off axis into a misaligned mess. In any case, all of these were decisions aimed at moving the ritual of bathing in some different direction. And here you're seeing the wash basin with the thermal surfaces in the Friedman uh, Bendai Gallery. And here's the iridescent finish. So in this next project, around the same time, you were also beginning to move in a somewhat different direction. Related, but different in a certain specific ways. We began to imagine projects, interiors mostly, um, that dream of being images rather than buildings. And so they originated uh, in qualities or ca characteristics more associated with the making of images than any traditional techniques or tectonics. Principles of opticality and saturation, brightness and contrast were things we were interested in. This led us in different material direction in how we conceived of elevations, walls, floors, surfaces. We were approached to design the first brick mortar flagship store for Jack Irwin on Madison Avenue in New York City, which until then had been an online retailer space and ironically just around the corner from Mises Seagram building which we'll talk about later uh, and which has become the subject of our contribution to the Taipei Biennale. The space was long and high but somewhat narrow so um, one aim was to multiply its dimensions through material effects, reflective surfaces, and a loose arrangement of elements. Uh, so I will talk about a few more recent projects um, sort of layered on top of this, um, this interest in, in, uh, in opticality um, has also been a kind of continuation of, of, of our interest in, in sort of looseness or, or loose collections, but at a, maybe at a somewhat different scale, um, maybe as a kind of meditation on the relationship between our own work and, and and consumer objects. Um, we uh, we were invited to, to contribute a show, uh, contribute to a show at the Triennale di Milano um, almost exactly a year ago today, called "The State of the Art of Architecture." Um, and uh, the show was organized as a kind of uh, performance that unfolded across three days. Each contribution was given a space on a central table, and one by one, the installations were mounted across those three days as the audience moved down this long semicircular. Um, uh, gallery hall. The only mandate was that each contributor had to carry uh, their contribution with them um, to the event. So our entry was conceived uh, as a kind of um, assembly of recent work, objects, images, texts, all of which could be unpacked from a single suitcase. Um, it included a series of um, soft and rigid elements, all part of a much sort of larger representational mess and this was a chance for us to to really begin to play with um, uh, some new software techniques some new ideas uh, around the animation of objects and um, the way in which objects possibly move around in computational space and how we might usefully think of that as a kind of disorganized form of organizing things um, we have some animations here mm -hmm. Thank you. 
you're seeing here a kind of segment of that long, that long shared table and ideas about bringing not just objects that we've made or text that we've wrote, um, but also different kinds of um, staging elements, fabrics and reflective elements, uh, and how, they, how all that, those can be brought into play with one another um, through these different representational techniques. Also, what kinds of things could be extracted from these animations? How, how, how would we extract things? How do we decide what to include and what not to include in the suitcase? And of course, just five days later, this is, this is the suitcase, I believe. Here's this, you're seeing the central hall. Short clip, I think, here from. So, yeah, I mean, it was, it was just five days after this that um, Milan was thrown into sort of total chaos and all of the existential unknowns that marked those, the, the early days. And the lecture, as Kyle mentioned, the lecture that we're now giving was meant to be given last year, but the uncertainties that were sort of piling up at that, that moment last March made the trip impossible. And I think it was just a few days later that um, Dean Speaks announced the closing of the school. So here we are now. Um, so we're, we'll show now um, two more projects. Um, these final two projects have obviously lived in a very different world than any of the previous work did. Um, they've had to navigate sort of waves of frustrations and, and impossibilities, um, delays, closures, displacements, disruptions um, of every shape and size, but they've also um, maybe for that reason have become um, really meaningful to us. Um, they've allowed us to keep moving forward and to really to stay in contact with clients and, and collaborators and also with our own um, team at Millions. Um, who are, of course, all now scattered and, and isolated from us, um, like everyone else. Um, <clears throat> so these projects have become sort of precious in that sense. Um, the first is our contribution to um, the Taipei Biennale, um, which we were invited by, by uh, Bruno Latour um, really back in 2019 to, to contribute to two shows, uh, one, at, one at ZKM um, in Karlsruhe in Germany, uh, which was to have taken place last May and which was not entirely canceled, but of course, actually amazingly, some of the work made it online um, and they were able to stage something like an online exhibition. Now, uh, ongoing right now in Taipei, opened a month ago, is the second iteration of that. You and I don't live on the same planet. And as you can tell from Bruno's curatorial statement and, and from his recent book, Down to Earth, the notion that, that many of us don't live on the same planet, we don't conceive of the earth as the same place. And oftentimes, the the earth we think we live on is not the one we're actually living out our lives on. Um, he, Bruno asked us to try to produce a project that would um, document the, the dissonance between, um, between the architectural object as it is built and its kind of terrestrial or territorial reach in, in, in the extractive and logistical reach that it is required for the construction of any single building. 
for this with that invitation, we couldn't we, we could think of no one better to collaborate with than our call our close colleague Kiel Mo, um, who's been working through a series of buildings. Uh, the book, the two last two books he published were Empire State Building and now um, Unless, which is a play on Mises Less is More. Um, and Kiel's work has really tried to unpack the material histories uh, around these two buildings, um, these two icons in New York City. And, and in particular with attention to the extractive um, embodied energy required to simply marshal all of this material into one location, but then also the, the tremendous records of maintenance and all of the chemicals and equipment that are, requir are required for, um, for maintaining a single building. Um, the argument being that we have to begin to think uh, about very different um, relationship between um, globalization and localization in our construction practices if we're ever going to push beyond this sort of bankrupt uh, the sort of bankrupt language of sustainability so um, we are we concentrated in this on the Seagram building as Zana mentioned earlier and that was uh, all of this is all the primary research is, is is Keels and then we worked with Keel and another collaborator Peter Osborne to produce a kind of um, immersive exhibition of this uh, in, in the, at the Taipei Fine Arts Museum. You're seeing here a lot of the primary images and research around um, the, the production of the Stevens Building. Yes, you can see here where we, we reproduced a lot of the documentation, the archival documentation around the, the the, the tremendous labor that's and, 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 and energy that's required for the maintenance of this building as, as representative of, of many other similar buildings throughout the world. Um, and we began to basically accumulate a series of objects, uh, what we're calling basically the material culture of the Seagram building. Um, any surfaces, any primary source, uh, sourced pavers, tiles, from uh, green marble to the pink granite and grasses and, and other. Uh, we also produced replicas um, of uh, some of the extrusions, also the bronze extrusions in the Seagram building, which are actually, we've learned from Kill's research that they are actually grass. Um, we began to accumulate them and then we, we were tasked to design basically the exhibition sort of display and setup. So, we produced um, or designed a series of reconfigurable tables that you're seeing here. Um, and uh, basically we, we came up with uh, this module of three tables that can be repeated and reconfigured in the space. And they would um, set up essentially three material cultures of the Seagram. So stone, glass, and bronze. And we began to also loosely arrange them, just like we did in the Taipei, uh, which is a continuation of our interest um, uh, in Milan, uh, excuse me, which is a continuation of our interest in this idea of loose arrangements uh, of collections. We're seeing here is a series of studies that we did uh, with gravity engines to begin to basically think about uh, and plan how these elements would sort of land on the tables um, in the different regions of stone, glass, and bronze. Um, and this is an animation uh, that begins to show um, some of our experiments um, in these kinds of uh, display techniques. You're seeing some of the fabrics that are used throughout the building and the furnitures and the curtains. Um, also, in some cases, we also chose to reproduce uh, elements that are rigid or, or only semi-rigid in soft materials. So drawing sets were printed on canvas to allow us to treat them more like fabric. Uh, you're seeing here the fabrication of the tables, tables in Taipei. They're sort of intentionally oversized. This is a very preliminary rendering. So one of the things that we also discussed with Kiel um, is the kind of environmental saturation of the Seagram. 
uh, both the kind of orange hue of some of the materials and the glass, but also um, the orange uh, as a sort of symbolic or uh, as an analogy for thermodynamics. So we began to look into possible saturations in the space, both through the sort of subtle coloring of the tables, but also through the light uh, setup. So in the beginning, the tables be, you know, were white and were assembled in the space. And then slowly um, from desaturation, they become, you know, uh, began to gain coloration with both the light, the film, and uh, the objects. Um, and the projection itself. We just received these images actually a few days ago. And here you're seeing the exhibition through the courtyard of the Taipei Museum of Fine Art. Um, so now we will end with the Everson Museum. So we're, we're, we're going to show a few preliminary images in this software, and then we're going to switch over to a keynote um, presentation that maybe gives a bit more clarity. Um, so as we'll show in the keynote in a moment, um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the competition, we, um, it, it began with this sort of um, radical prompt from um, Louise Rosenfield, who is a ceramics collector, a collector of functional ceramics primarily, and has amassed a, a rather large collection of over 3,000 pieces um, of, of functional ceramics. Some of them sort of sit on the, at the edge of functionality, but nonetheless, they all were meant to be used in some way. And Louise, Louise intended to donate this to the Everson, and, but with just one simple rule, which is that the collection had to be used in, in a new cafe um, in the museum, which is a fairly radical gesture by any um, measure of, of, um, of museum practice. Uh, obviously, one of the mandates of museum practice is generally a kind of like tactile separation between the viewer and the object. And in this case, uh, Louise felt quite convicted that, um, that uh, the only way to understand uh, ceramics was through their use and by holding them and touching them. So why don't we switch over to... Yes, we will switch over. Switch over to the keynote. Give us just one second to transition here. Okay, so we'll, we'll go through this. We have a lot of slides for Everson, so we'll try to go through it relatively quickly so we can leave a lot of time for question and answer. Um, so, of course, we, if, giving this lecture in Syracuse, it's much easier to, um, to uh, give a brief introduction to the building because you're all familiar with it. So we'll just skip over that part of it for a minute. collection of functional art. It is those pots when they are not in use are just sleeping. Um, their information that they give out is when somebody collaborates with it, each piece individually. So I would hate to see the bulk of it end up in a museum where it can only be looked at and rarely touched. So um, I have some kind of fantasy where um, you know some curator might pick a couple of pieces that are for some reason more important. I can't imagine what those would be, but I would make that offer. And then everything else would go to a restaurant and that it would be used until it's all broken except for the last piece. And then the last piece with the story of the Rosenfield collection could go somewhere to some archive or some historical place. 
So that's um, that, that's that was during our preliminary research um, on the project. We came our our team came across this podcast recording that Louise had made several years ago, um, which really lays out her sort of vision for her collection and that that this sort of radical conception of use um, was something that that we seized upon very early. We wanted to understand, we wanted to really understand why she felt this way. And in a way it drove us into questions, um, immediately into questions around what typically within a, a, um, a museum is a very strict division between front of house and back of house activities. So every museum has extensive back of house. Um, uh, we looked into the, 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 the history of the sort of emergence of the back of house. So, so as the as the private as the private cabinet of curiosities over time across the 19th and into the 20th century, maybe back to the 18th, became the National Museum or the Public Museum. Um, of course, uh, the collection had to be managed somehow and rotated, and elements mo mo the bulk of the collection would be out of view most of the time, and only a small percentage of it would be on view most of the time. And this this division really held until relatively recently, and. Today, it's, it's been clearly placed in crisis by the emergence of the experience economy more broadly. Um, and you begin to see this in, in more recent museums uh, like the Toledo uh, Glass Pavilion or, or at the Broad in LA where there's this attempt to sort of place the back of house on view. We see this uh, in, the, in our, uh, diagrammatically as really just a sort of partial window onto the back of house. We wanted to almost radicalize that conception more and we, we settled on this term, um, we, should, we seem to us there should be strategies of sort of controlled exposure. And, and, and of course, these are all new buildings and we didn't have that idea. We didn't have the ability to design a new building. So many of these contemporary techniques were off the table to us anyway. Um, and so um, our first challenge was how to adapt this existing building, not by exposing views onto the back of house, but by introducing new elements that would somehow be a hybrid that would draw the back of house into the front of house in specific ways. And so this phrase FOBO was just in our office the whole summer um, in 2019 it was. So we were thinking that we need elements and strategies in which aspects of both the front of house and the back of house uh, are not just exposed to one another but are reimagined uh, and recombined in certain ways. Um, and one of the sort of first uh, or let's say the second challenge but but the first way to address this issue is through light. Um, this image, this construction image of the Everson slowly became perhaps the single most important image of, uh, for us in the office as we, worked, uh, as we worked on it. And partially because um, when this part of the museum, um, you know, the, the east wing of the museum is not naturally lit, you see that actually it was conceived in such a way that it produces a very contrasting and extreme um, sections of light. Um, so these strong sort of contrast between light and dark um, that affect the whole composition of the East Wing um, became very clear to us as inherently uh, present in the form and in the way I am Pei conceived of it. Um, of course, this is a technical term that is used by artists um, and historians, but uh, the question was, how does it, how is it sort of achieved, let's say, in a volume, uh, in a three-dimensional object? Um, so we had this kind of paradox where the, the same sculptural massing that gives Everson its iconic character also, um, also produces certain areas of the museum that are, have dramatically uneven natural lighting conditions, which is less of a problem in a gallery space or as this wing was originally conceived as a kind of members lounge. Um, but it poses a kind of serious problem for, for a cafe. Um, and anyone that's been in this area knows how much it relies upon artificial lighting. Um, As most of you know, the, the scope of the competition involved essentially reimagining uh, how to use the collection, uh, the ceramics collection from Louise Rosenfield, and how to basically implement it or, or use it within the context of a cafe. So the scope initially was just to redesign the cafe, which is you're seeing above here uh, where it says lounge um, in this image. This was um, the first image we, we gave in the first round of the competition. Um, it's tied into a lot of the ideas that Zena described around the Jack Irwin project with opticality. One of the ideas we had from the beginning was just to use a range of material and geometric techniques to dramatically um, multiply the amount of natural light that's reflecting and refracting throughout the entire 
East Wing, really. And we begin to think about uh, of a family of elements that would be used as uh, essentially elements that would be inserted um, within the museum. So we were not allowed to touch any of the surfaces of the original IMP building. Um, essentially, none of the concrete surfaces could be touched in any way. Um, so, we, so our intervention became more about um, uh, sort of insertions and individual insertions in spaces. Um, these elements, we began to think of them as uh, serving as a kind of curatorial uh, surfaces, both horizontal and vertical. Um, in the end, what we propose is a kind of loose assemblage, a loose collection of discrete elements, which provide flexible surfaces for curation, but also for communality. Um, the elements are the glass curatorial towers, which we also refer to in the office as the prismatic machines, um, the lightweight movable feast tables, um, and the concrete demonstration gallery podiums, um, which would be used for curation um, and real-time demonstration. And these elements um, you know, would intensify and redirect light into some of the darker spaces as well. Yeah, we, we'll have to go relatively quickly through these because we we don't want to. This is a sort of lecture in and of itself, um, so we'll we'll maybe cycle through these. Yeah, so these are the curatorial towers, uh, which would be inserted within the piers, uh, the concrete piers of the cafe. Uh, we were interested in basically these elements as being there but not there, hence how you know infinitely thin they were. Um, which uh, again is something that we began testing in the Jack Irwin store. Um, these are some of the kind of prismatic glass research that we were looking into and how they might actually uh, bring in light from the skylight and uh, reflect them into the space. Um, you can see the you can see that that sort of dramatic chiaroscuro here and also the, if you go to the next one we've, we've met we've worked with James Carpenter a bit um, consulting with him because he um, it, it, you know he's a sort of master of these techniques and um, his first observation was how that concrete is one of the most light absorbing materials. So we'll have to do something about that in, in these prismatic towers as well. This is just a very simple daylight study that we have done. So at this point, the scope of the, of the competition has uh, actually expanded. So we are no longer just focused on the cafe. We are actually uh, helping with the restoration of, of the museum, but also uh, ex we've ex the scope has been expanded to the entire East Wing. So we are actually working on both the upper and the lower floor, but because of COVID, um, we've sort of changed our timeline. So now the, the, the priority is phase one, let's say, is the lower floor, which is the library. Um, it's a research library, new ceramics gallery, and all of the staff areas are being redone. And phase two would be the cafe. So here you're beginning to see some of the uh, experimental renders of um, the area below where, that we're enclosing with uh, glass. Um, there will be also some uh, fabric and curtain elements to separate the office spaces from the atrium. We've completely rethought the circulation at the lower floor so that the public can have access to the atrium. Uh, uh, at the moment, the public is not allowed access to this area of the museum. I think we have an image of that stack. This is the, an image of the research library um, that's being that's currently being done in phase one. This is the staff door that that many, many of you who know the museum well, you're probably familiar with this door. Um, the, on the left hand side, you're standing in the in the main ceramics gallery downstairs. And so, as part of the competition, we propose the only the only physical modification we proposed for the competition was the removal of this door, and and the opening up of the image on the right. Which was currently, which was previously a, a staff area, and the, the the reorganization of that into a new gallery that uh, the museum director Elizabeth Dunbar is sort of referring to as a jewel box gallery. Um, the next series of elements we'll be doing is essentially the tables, uh, which will be in the next phase. And here are some photos of uh, the current status of the museum. These these um, are from last summer. Fall. Over the summer, yeah. rest, waterproofing and, and series of sort of outdoor restorations had to be done, uh, concrete restorations and waterproofing. Um, we began to sort of demo and demolish inside, remove all the carpets. Those of you who know this area, you know it was all 
it was previously carpeted, but in, in, in his original documents, in Pei's original set, um, it's not carpeted. So we're restoring it back to its, its, its original state. Um, so we will begin polishing the concrete. There's a lot of um, basically concrete damage like this that we were, we're working on at the moment. The east wing is essentially 70% submerged. I mean, it's um, only, only the upper 30% is above ground. And so maybe the upper 40% is above ground. So, so uh, they, the, build, the, the, building, the, man, the building managers and, and staff and, and, the, and the administration struggles a lot with, with um, expansion joint issues and, and all the typical leakage issues, but a, a tremendous amount of work was done on that over the summer. Um, and then the next phase will be to redo the ceilings. So um, we're sort of beginning the demo, uh, demolition of the ceiling uh, next week. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much, Evie. I'll turn it thank over you. to you right away. Yeah, I was also going to say thank you. Uh, this was really fantastic. And I, 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 uh, I always find your work so beautiful and hunting and atmospheric. And it's nice to get a chance to talk about it uh, tonight. Um, I, I guess to speak to atmospheres, I wanted to ask about the sort of tension between parts of the project that are expressly still and parts of the project that are always in sort of in a state of flickering or being dynamic. And I'm thinking, of course, you know, of, for instance, the loose arrangement for the Friedman Benda bathroom, not fixtures that were however many hundreds of pounds heavy, you mentioned, but then they're coated in this iridescent kind of ever-changing um, color. Uh, so I would love to hear a little bit more about this, I think so specific to your work, or maybe one more uh, sort of example to set is even the way you're presenting tonight, the sort of the stillness of the keynote versus the half-baked images uh, or the, the software that renders you sort of maybe a little elusive, if that's the proper word. Um, yeah. I, th I think to the, to the first question, the, there's, uh, we've had a, a long interest in um, in in one-to-one -one 3D printing um, and maybe how that is, how that's changing our, our profession mostly for the worse right now, um, because most of the products that you find that, that are trying to really realize one-to-one -one, um, architectural objects by way of 3D printing are pretty banal. Um, and, uh, but on the other hand, we're, we're sort of fascinated with it because we know it's not, it's not as if it's gonna go away and we might as well embrace it. Um, and so we, we, made, we might as well take it on as a project and ask what, what are the real possibilities of working at, at full scale in 3D printing um, and what are, its limits, what, are, what are its limitations. And one of the things we found is that a lot of um, the detailing is, um, be, becomes a, a kind of hyper intense concentration on surfaces. Um, because uh, because so much of the volumetric work is done by the printer, um, that that then the post processing is where a lot of a lot of the um, a lot of the the detailing work can be done. And I think maybe what you're pointing to is is the result of mm -hmm. that in some ways. I mean, and maybe there's a so the first part of the lecture we kind of went through fast because we typically spend a lot of time when we present on our uh, early work, uh, speculative work on the collectives and uh, Kyle mentioned Beirut rooftop uh, amongst others. And we from the beginning have been really interested in the contrast of saturation, desaturation, but also like heaviness, extreme heaviness, so let's say, uh, and solidity um, contrasted with extreme thinness and lightness. Uh, uh, and in some ways the atmosphere is also of images. So, um, so what you're seeing in bedding again is in some ways um, at the tail end of a series of projects that were pr pretty much, you know, precisely interested in, in solidity and variable thickness, uh, both in concrete, but also uh, as we started, to, you know, experiment with 3D silica print. So the, the bedding again wash basin is a 3D silica print. Um, uh, which is kind of slightly different than, than tip, other typical so 3D printing techniques. But then again, as John was saying, like the, at, when you 3D print something at one-to-one, -one, all of a sudden detailing is no longer part of uh, the process. And so what becomes the focus is really the finish. Um, or, or at least where, that those processes get very rearranged. 
um, um it's I mean, a yeah, yeah. The, the sort of uh yeah what you mean the by weight, I guess. what we mean by detailing uh, fundamentally changes under those yeah. conditions um and of course i mean it given the heaviness of it uh we have to calibrate uh, com computationally like really well how the wash basin would land on the thermal surfaces the uh, uh uh, the concrete thermal surfaces and how then also they lay on top of each other. Mm -hmm. So, so even though they seem loose, they have to be very well calibrated in advance, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting as well. I, I think to the second point, the, the you know the the presentation instrument is in a way it's our it's it's in in some ways it grows out of just our own becoming bored with linear keynote presentations. Um, so we we sort of just got tired of of, of giving them and. Um, and also, but but maybe more, maybe and more, maybe, yeah, also. maybe more interestingly, they they don't even operate the way images really operate. Um, they operate the way slides operate, and and so they don't really take advantage. They don't actually take advantage of the screen as a medium. You mean the the, 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 keynote, the keynote yeah. lectures don't or really. Um, yeah, I mean, and it's funny. Like when we set up this, what we call the instrument. Um, what I'm sure you guys have noticed is that. Um, line drawings, you know, don't look very good on it, right? Because it's precisely meant to be for uh, raster, it's for pixels. Um, you know, any kind of pixel content, um, and and also to some extent uh, animations and in, in, in movies as well. But um, so, and that became really interesting to us because, of course, like a big chunk of our work is about um, the kind of incident incident of of, of computer graphics and and errors. Mm -hmm. In the making of images and the opportunities of, of that, so um, we we I think this coinciding with also what John said, but also um, this idea that the, you know a presentation has to to be so precious in some ways, uh, you know, all of this culminated into the instrument that is an experiment at the moment, and, and we're not sure yet if it's successful or, or not, but. Um, but in some ways, it, what's interesting about it is that it produces a kind of less precious uh, way of presenting the work. It also doesn't allow us to ever give exactly the same lecture because it, it's, it's randomized. It's basically impossible. So it, it's always so. different. Yeah. yeah. That's what I love about it, that it just truly, uh, in, in the sort of cold context of Zoom that we're all in, in our sort of individual spaces, we do share an atmosphere in a way. And maybe that's extremely poetic. Just <laughs> something I do say that often, uh, but yeah, sort of giving up control and allowing this thing to exist between us and not repeat itself, I, I, I find totally fascinating. And I do think it, it resonates with the work as well in, a, uh, in that sort of um, tension between things that are planned and things that are unplanned and specific or loose in many ways. Um, I was also interested uh, in something you said, mid lecture, mid lecture, and these two things are maybe uh, not all that uh, interconnected. But at some point, you uh, you were speaking, Zena was speaking about optimism and ideas of collectivity, uh, but you made sure to sort of exclude utopias out of it, sort of alluding to a kind of cynicism. And it, I think it's a really important conversation to have, you know, right here, right now in this moment, and with students present uh, to look at the divide between what is optimism and what is a utopia and how do you sort of secure yourself from it or plan against it. Mm. Yeah, that's really a good point. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, you know, I don't, I'm not sure how exactly we, we draw the line because we probably, I don't know that any two people would agree on a, on a sort of like fixed definition of what utopian really means, but um, I think the distinction for us has to do with um, uh, being being equally self-critical in those speculations about um, uh, about assuming assuming knowledge of other people's desires. Um, we've, you know, I, I think the text that we wrote a number of years ago now on on new masses for new masses, the, the the collectivity after orthography. I mean, at some point in in, in asking that, you have to ask. If, if it's possible for people to live together, does anybody even really want to? I mean, I think that's a, probably a fair question. It could be a kind of internal. You have to remember all of this is pre-COVID. Um, the, the other thing is that we also, we have a kind of living experiment out here on our property in, in outside Los Angeles, where we, we have a, a bit of a, of a collective situation and we've, we've been able to experiment with 
with what we've called shared separateness, which is that um, that maybe through design people can still um, isolate themselves when when desired, and then spend time together when. So we when share desired. we share utilities uh, with another couple, and we share two other uh, workshop with two other um, houses. So it, in some ways, we are kind of actively testing some of these things here, um, and we've increasingly it became clear to us that we cannot be utopian about it because, or even nostalgic, um, because again, in some ways, a share, shared separateness is maybe more of the moment than uh, what, it, what collective experiments meant in the 70s, for example. Um, so this is something that sort of we're just kind of thinking through. Um, but it's also in the, it has to be in the, in, in, it has to be driven down to the level of geometry. I mean, um, there's a lot of very cynical experiments right now in curated living um, for a very specific elite segment of the population, and we certainly aren't are not are not interested in that uh, at all. Um, and so I think, hopefully, in the work, it's, it makes its way into the actual plan making um, ideas about um, more open collectives that are not um, that aren't predicated on some kind of, as we said, some kind of rigid social order. I see hands. <laughs> yeah, we'll go. Uh, thanks, Evie. I'll, we'll open it up to others. Um, uh, I'll start with one of the questions in the chat, and then we'll go to Vasundra. Um, and I'll paraphrase Eric's question um, about animations. Um, and to paraphrase, maybe I'll, I'll ask, what is the what do you understand to be the value of the animation as a medium of representation for your office and for your work? And at what point is it determined that a rendering is something that's useful or necessary to make, either as part of the design process or merely as, I say merely, but it transcends that, of course, a tool of representation? Right. Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I mean, for us, um, basically, we've slowly, I think plans in some ways and sections are no longer part of our process um, in some ways. And I'm sure many share this sentiment, but um, there are necessary moments where you have to produce them, of course, and especially if you're, you know, uh, you know producing a permit set or any number of, of sort of construction drawings. But um, in the kind of experimental and early phases of design, um, animation play a very important role in how we uh, either uh, compose things or begin to think about the looseness of form. Um, like in the case of the Taipei Biennial, um, it it was uh, instrumental um, in how we thought about the tables, their geometries, um, their angles, their rotational um, systems, but also how we lay things on the table was primarily based on uh, the like series of iter iterative uh, and animation experiments that we did. Um, so it's directly sort of implemented in, in the decision making and design making. Um, there are also other projects that we haven't really showed, like uh, shown like in the collectives, um, we have an animation that basically presents um, not so much the material reality of the project, but rather um, the, the path spatial, of the, the, spatial the spatial realities, but also the, the way the CNC uh, machine works and operates. So it shows the kind of path um, of the machine and the machine, of course, um, sure, it runs on G-code, but ultimately um, the, the animation is a better way of planning how the machine would operate and would cut than a plan or an elevation or a section. Um, there, there's also, I mean, there's, we didn't, as we, as I think we mentioned, we're, there's, there's a kind of like um, politics of ther thermodynamics or sort of like um, energetic dimension to our work that doesn't really come up in the projects we showed today other than maybe the, the, the content of the Taipei um, show. But um, that the a animations have a tremendous um, value in anything like that. I mean, if you think about it, orthography is really quite terrible at representing environments. Um, it's not meant to represent dynamic things it's, and, and invisible things like, like air flows and, and, and temperatures and things like that. It was. It was brilliant at managing visible, the visible and the material, and it's not as competent at managing the invisible and the immaterial or the microscopic. And so 
Um, we also, I would say we rely on a lot of simple GIFs and animations for understanding all kinds of um, environmental conditions, especially around um, our non-speculative projects, meaning the things that we mm -hmm. actually, the ones that we do build. Um, so, you know, fin finishing a, a sort of housing proposal right now out here in LA, uh, we've run tons of, of animations thinking about um, the, the sort of thermal conditions of that. Uh, great, thanks for the question, Eric. Vasundra, go ahead. Hi, um, Zana and John, thank you for the lecture. Um, you guys really touched upon a lot of things that um, I'm personally very invested in, so it's really exciting to hear. Um, my question for you is that, as Kyla described um, your practice of like how you think of architecture as a speculative medium, would you say, And but in your writing, um, you know, you talk about how signalization is ultimately creating predictability and like it's um, no longer about like the speculative anymore. So w what sort of, I guess, relevance does it leave architecture as a conceptual practice or as a physical manifestation um, or is it obsolete in your mind? Uh, no, it's not obsolete at all. Um, but it, it does require, um, it requires really understanding what we mean when we say the word digital. Um, and we've tried to write a lot about in different ways, uh, write a lot about what we think it, the, the digital has really meant. So for example, Zana's looked into in some of her essays, the way in which in, in early computer graphics culture, because there wasn't really software available, the, the artists actually had to design their own hardware and software. Um, and, and so really unexpected and, and, and remarkably unique results come out of that. That's, that's quite literally the inverse of the way we are now asked to work under norm, quote unquote normal conditions within architecture, which are essentially are framed by proprietary software and proprietary hardware that we all, as we all know, has has certain has severe endemic output tendencies meaning um it, you have to work extremely hard within those proprietary systems to get anything novel to come out of them um and so it's just been a basic fact of our work of our way of working from the day we met that we we uh, even at a pre-discursive level we just agreed that we want we didn't want to do that we didn't want to work that way and so that that that's not to say, of course, in, in, in every day in, in the office on an everyday basis, of course, we're using Rhino, we're using AutoCAD, we're using the things we have to use to get projects pushed forward. But, but we always want those more normative systems to be sitting right alongside a set of non-normative, much more experimental, much more prone to failure. I mean, like that piece of software that we just presented this lecture on actually crashed four times this morning. So we had no idea if we'd make it through that lecture. Um, without it crashing, but it, but so what? I mean, that's it's much more interesting than than um, than the opposite. And so yeah, I, th I think of course it's I, it's not obsolete at all. But you have to you have to make it a project. You have to make it a, a part of your project. Uh, it, otherwise, then you you will largely be in service of um, of you know what I've called in my own writing signalized automation. Thanks for the question, Vasundra. Uh, Esther asked a great question about your new puppy, but then said to ignore this question. So I'll let you you guys Hi, correspond <laughs> privately to discuss all things puppy related. Puppy's um, taking a nap. There's another question. It's similar to one that I wanted to ask from Ching Huen, and I'll paraphrase her question as well. Um, she's asking about the role of audience in your projects slash experiments. Um, and the way I was going to frame the question was, um, the earlier in the talk you you mentioned cycles of life and that makes me think of ritual and just user engagement which is part of uh, Brittany's question as well i i wonder to what extent when you're like in the bathing again project um, mm -hmm. as well as bay rooftop as well as in parts of everson if you imagine that the things you've designed or the environments that you've designed or the atmospheres that you've provoked are those things that are meant to be um, engaged with um consciously experienced um subconsciously are is your design and are your environments um, protagonists in the narrative and in, in which a user is really consciously engaging with or are they meant to be more of a kind of stage set for these kind of cycles of life and rituals to unfold almost in a more 
subversive um, way in, 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 with regards to how they influence behavior and ritual and activity? Maybe both. Yeah, I think I was thinking both too. I mean, we, we always actually talk about this in the office, like we, uh, we have no interest in trying to dictate anybody's life uh, or way of life. Um, and, and we don't think, you know, that it would be the respectful way to do, to do it. But, but in some ways, um, again, I think the, the atmosphere, the surfaces and their kind of like reflective nature and, um, and their opticality um, are dynamic. They're not static. So in some ways they particip participate in a kind of ever-changing environment. Um, and they become, they become both the kind of uh, the audience and the camera in some ways at the same time. Um, and as for, uh, I guess the audience for some of the other projects, and I'm not sure if I fully understood the question. I mean, I think in a way, maybe what you're pointing to is, uh... I don't know. I mean, I, I I'm trying to think back on like kind of the origins of of a lot of the early work. Um, mm -hmm. I I think maybe because I was like a, I I was an undergraduate philosophy nerd that had to read a lot of um, ancient Greek philosophy, and and then when 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 you walk around Beirut, you basically trip over um, you know uh, ruins thousands of years old, and so in a weird way, we I think our work has we're all we both we're just continually fascinated with the past and how other cultures have lived differently at different times. And so um, there's, there's as, we, as we've said, I think as we say probably too often, we're not nostalgic for those periods. They were full of terrible inequalities and, and we're not naive about that. But, um, but we do think that certain kinds of ideas can be dragged from the past into the present productively. And, and in a weird way, there's a kind of, I think there's a, we, we never sat down and said this, but maybe there's a kind of ancient futurism in, 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 what, in what we're doing. Um, because, yeah, I don't know. There's no, we're, we're not, we're, we're neither technophobic nor technophilic. I, I, I don't, but the audience, I, the question of the audience, I think, as Zaina said, I, I think Kyle, more directly your question is, it's, it's really both maybe. Like we want the work to be countercultural. We want, we're, we don't have any interest in serving um, serving culture in a, in a kind of passive way uh, as a sort of like, you know, bespoke boutique firm or something like that. So hopefully the, hopefully the work eventually meets and it's starting to meet clients that are interested in, in living really differently. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, ultimately it, what it comes down to is a kind of open-minded um, client in some ways. Like we've, uh, we've you know, we've been, contacted by, for example, um, a couple who are interested in basically bu building a, a sort of an art compound in upstate New York, not too far from Syracuse actually, um, who are interested in testing some of these ideas uh, with a very reasonable budget. So they're not like particularly wealthy. Um, so, and, and again, it's, it's people in their thirties and their forties who are you know, interested in, in trying to live differently in a way that is not um, gimmicky, uh, like like developers put it when they think about sustainability. So, um, so I don't know. I mean, I think ultimately it's both. It's 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 both us creating kind of dynamic atmosphere that might subversively influence the way we might use a space, um, geometries that could influence the way we occupy um, a room, uh, and uh, and the user itself uh, having you know uh, maybe. A commitment to a different way of life. Yeah, so I think it's all at once. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you started by answering the question in, in saying that you wouldn't want to dictate behavior, but I also think there's a way in which you, you're, you desire to be present or to have a kind of positive impact without being overbearing absolutely. and without dictating. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think, I think about that yeah. in relation to, to a project you didn't present tonight, the Beirut rooftop, which if I remember its concept uh, accurately, it deals a bit with how you Imagine activity would uh, would unfold in a in an environment that uh, in in which the thermal comfort is kind of in flux throughout the day relative to access to heat gain natural yeah. heat gain and things like that, and I th yeah. I think that was a really um, uh, wonderful way of thinking about the the uh, the influence of these kind of natural cycles of of the earth and of uh, the building's access to sunlight and in relation to activity and ritual that doesn't, it's not dictated solely by a kind of plan arrangement. It's, it's related yeah. to, to atmospherics and 
um, and also yeah. has a kind of sustainability tilt to it that I think syncs up nicely with thinking about ritual and activity. And again, that one for me felt perfectly in between this kind of like dictate versus uh, get out of the way and let people have what right. they want. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe uh, there's one more question in the chat and, and we can end with that one unless there are other ones. Um, Umut is asking if you could talk a bit more about your approach to negative space and the notion of emptiness or nothingness as you think about arranging objects in space. And, and he asks, do you ever study the space in a figure ground approach? And I, I think on top of that is also just what seems to be a recurring interest in um, not invisibility, but just touching down lightly and uh, yeah, the, the emptiness of the space around the, 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 the spaces in which you touch down. Mm. Interesting. And these are all great questions tonight. Um, I, I mean, I think you probably would start to see an arc in the work where the earlier work was really interested in computational solidity. So essentially very solid, heavy things, but that are um, conceived of uh, with you know computational processes like 3D printing or other, um, and then slowly I think the work is starting to move into um, maybe infinite thinness in some ways, and um, maybe in the Jack Irwin uh, you saw a beginning of a kind of hybrid of a very solid stage in the middle and then extremely thin, um, uh, you know, shell shelving aluminum shelving systems that we had to push the kind of limits of of what they can carry. Um, without bending, um, and uh, and then uh, you know in in the Everson Museum where again we are dealing with uh, an existing building that is heavy and solid, um, in which we basically the way we can intervene is through insertions, and so the insertions became all about um, infinite thinness, invisibility, they're not there, um, fabric lightness. Um, um, and coupled with that is an interest in, in light and, and sort of atmospherics through projection and lighting, which also in some ways are immaterial. Um, so our work seems to always sort of um, oscillate between he ext extremely heavy, like an 800 pound sink, <laughs> to an extremely light, uh, a piece of fabric or even an image projected on a wall. Um, and there seems to be no kind of in between, which is interesting. Um, the Taipei um, furniture set began as actually a very solid sort of inverted pyramids and then slowly as we developed them tectonically and as we started to think through their fabrication and how they might be fabricated overseas and uh, how they might be moved because as you, you saw they're really big each module. Um, we started to move into what we called apparent solids, um, essentially uh, objects that from one corner appear heavy and seamless, and then from another actually uh, are thin and, and assembled, uh, so seamed. Um, and that's something that actually we're, we're starting to like push forward also in some aspects of the uh, Everson Museum furniture. Um, so it doesn't you know, answer your question directly about negatives, but I would say um, the, 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 sort of, the sort of computational solidity aspect of our work is all about um, uh, subtractions. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about subtractions that you would, you know, conceive of these things through subtraction is really how we, we really thought about it. Yeah, I mean, I think the closest we, we would come to it, like a kind of figure ground analysis was in, was in those earlier sort of digital solidity projects, um, you know, like the ones that are just over Zana's shoulder uh, on the camera, where um, they really were about thinking about positive and negatives. Um, and a lot of that was tied into uh, airflow and, and or kind of open air object conceived of in a certain climate. Uh, aside from that, I don't know, maybe, maybe the question also stems from like some of the rendering atmospheres, um, which tend to be sort of, um, they imply a kind of infinite space, but maybe that's just a kind of working space, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, some of the plans in the collectors and rooftop, uh, they, they also seem to, you know, they indicate like um, solids removed from other solids as well, or geometries removed from other geometries. And as we push them forward, um, we no longer think of the poche as actual solid, but we start to think of them as assembled somehow. Um, 
so anyway, but there is definitely maybe indirectly a kind of figure ground study in those in those plans. Yeah. Aside from that, we probably we probably Don't try not to think about nothingness too much. <laughs> Yeah, I think with the specifically with the animations, I think there's a kind of immaterial and abstractness that lends itself to that sense of nothingness. Maybe you don't see um, renderings populated with tons of people and accessories. Yeah. I mean, the, there are accessories in the way that you have things populate the table. That's part of the project, though. It's not part of a kind of scene that you're that you're building out. So, mm -hmm. I, I guess the way the way that you talk about lightness also reminds me of a lecture that happened a few weeks before yours was supposed to happen. And I think one of the last ones we had in person was Evie and Joffer and they were asked the question about, I forget exactly how Professor Ann Munley worded it, but it had something to do with lightness, but in their case, it was more about like the absence of their presence. And I see, mm -hmm. I see that, I see this idea of lightness um, proliferate through both of your practices, but in very different ways. And I suppose that's a conversation for another time, um, maybe one that also includes questions about puppies. Uh, there's one more quick question. Where did it go? Oh, uh, Vasundra was asking, which software did you use to create the glitch filter? And I think I know the answer. It's that it's a software that you wrote. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a custom interface. Yeah. So Vasundra, email them and see how much it costs if you want to get your hands on it. Yeah, it just runs off a it just runs off a kind of like standard mixer. But, but yeah, um, it's, a custom, it's a custom software. Great, thank you both um, so much for spending time with us and, and really completing the, now you're visiting Critic Studios, finally complete, <laughs> months months after it actually took place. Uh, one, one thing quick to say is maybe if people wanna turn on their cameras and let Sina and John know that they're not, it's people not just here. four of us here, just say <laughs> thank you and goodbye. Yeah, thank you so much and, and hope to see you here again sometime soon. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be coming back to Syracuse often as soon as it's safe enough to do so. Yeah. We've, we've made a few do. trips, we've made a few trips, but, but we're, we're, were, we're limiting it right now until things are a little more under control. We've had, a, John was there in October for literally like 24 hours. Mm. <laughs> um, but other than that, we haven't been in a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, visit us again soon. Thank you and good night, well, everybody. Thank you so much for the invitation. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.